Simpson. Okay. I gotta, oh, look, oh, I gotta he, look that brother how, up. How y'all yeah. doing out there tonight? <laughs> be a he was small. Brother. I mean, we just gonna your take voice. it nice He's and slow. That part. <laughs> <laughs> I might be done miss my call in there. Yeah. <laughs> this is your call. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna ease into that question then. Okay. Um, no, I'm sorry. So to say that there's a specific strategy, I would I, honestly I would have to to think about that because I think the anticipatory grief is not as intense. I don't think is like again once the once the loss has happened, right? Mm-hmm. Um and I'm and I and I'm just saying that just off the cuff. I don't think it is as intense as like that that grief process. Mm-hmm. But what I do think is important in terms of strategizing is to not run away mm-hmm. from the reality or the awareness that you have to lean into it. Mm-hmm. Um there is, uh, do I have his book here? David Kiesler, who wrote um, Finding Meaning, and he was actually like a mentee of Kubler-Raw, since we're talking about the five stages of grief here. Mm-hmm. Um, in this book, he he notes that he researched Buffalo. And, you know, he makes a joke about it, about researching Buffalo, and he's like, oh, the reason for that is, he said, one of the Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Speaking With Gravity. I am your host, Joshua Williams. Welcome back everyone, my name is Hannah. Oh. You Hello, I'm Tamara. <laughs> and I'm Terrence. We can be very informal here, just, just letting you know Tamara. Tamara's our guest, okay. actually, everyone. Yeah. Tamara's our guest. <laughs> yeah. Special, yeah. special. V- yeah. Very <laughs> special guest, very special guest. She has a lot of great things going on right now, and we want her to talk about it a little bit. Just, just to get, want, want to give a little context real quick, y'all. So today we're going to be talking about grief, right? Grieving holistically, a very important and a very sensitive subject, I know, mm-hmm. for, for a lot of our listeners, for us as well being up here on this stage uh doing what we do so uh, so we're glad that you could join us today and we hope that you find some things that are you know that that that, that you can take with you and um that, that can help you out along your journey but episode 81 y'all episode 81 that's right kobe numbers let's go yeah kobe put up 81 <laughs> back in the day oh, mm-hmm. um but yeah, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> <Never mind all that. laughs> I was like, I can't keep up. I don't know what you're talking about. We move a little bit, don't we? Right. But we want to move to you now. So okay. we'd we love to love for you to introduce yourself and, and to our great audience here and awesome. hear more about you. Okay, well, I'm Tamara Houston. I am, geez, I'm going to go down the list. So I'm a clinical social worker, which okay. means I provide therapy, mental health therapy or psychotherapy. Um, I am a clinical supervisor as well. So that is where I work with um, LMSWs or people that have like a master's in social work and they're working toward their independent licensure. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see, supervision. I provide consultation to private practices that are either starting up or expanding their practice. So I've been doing that for a couple of years. Um, I'm an EMDR approved consultant as well. So that's the type of therapy that I use as trauma informed. Mm -hmm. I offer intensives and doing that work. Um, I'm a training coach for EMDR as well. Mm -hmm. And oh, geez. Oh, I'm the founder of Healing Through Time, which is my um, kind of grief resource brand Mm -hmm. that I started a couple of years ago, and um, we'll get into that later. Um, Evidently, I'm I'm a podcaster. Yes, (laughs) yes, yes. I'm a podcaster. Um, It is called The Healing Bloom, A Safe Space to Grieve. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. Um, Mm -hmm. New to the game, but yeah, I'm Mm -hmm. doing that. So, congrats on that endeavor. Most definitely. Thank you. I'm an author too. I didn't bring my other book, but um, I have some materials here. But um, some years ago, I co authored an anthology called Fortitude. So, yeah. Beautiful. Lots of beautiful. I told her she wasn't uh, the 
tell everything I'm gonna call out, but it sounds like she did a pretty good job. So everything yeah. that she yeah. did, she down that list. <laughs> it sounds like yeah. you have your hands full, but what led you to the profession of mental health and grief counseling? Mm. So I'm gonna try to make a long story short. I think with um, therapy, it was something that I just slid into. That was not my intention. Mm-hmm. At all. Like, had someone told me that I was going to be a therapist years ago, maybe when I started college, I would have called them a liar to their face because that was just not what I was interested in. I like macro work and working with people, but the thought of, like, doing therapy, I was like, mm. What's macro um, work? What's macro work? Macro would be like nonprofit work, program okay, development, okay. stuff like that. So um, I'm a creative at heart, and I like to work with people and build things. So mm-hmm. that was that's really my passion, to be honest with you. I think I'm better at that than I am a therapist, to be honest <laughs> with you. But I think it, it works hand in hand. So um, I just really hopped into therapy in that way, pushed by my mentors. Oh, wow. Them providing me different opportunities, and um, I like a challenge. I mm-hmm. like to um, for somebody to tell me I can't do something, so I'm gonna do it anyway. Just <laughs> to, that kind of thing. And and grief actually was um, a topic that that came about something that was really passionate for me even before I even thought about like a career in mm-hmm. doing grief work anyway, like it com- comes from a more personal aspect, mm-hmm. family stuff that I saw going on being, um, I'm a nerd. So I was really curious about seeing, watching people and how they grieve and mm-hmm. wanting to just know more. But I mean, it's my family. So they're going to look at me like, right. you know, what, <laughs> why? Um, so I knew that I wanted to get into hospice work. Okay. So through some other jobs, I ended up getting into hospice. I worked in hospice for eight years, and I really contribute that to being like my training ground for the mm-hmm. therapist that I am today, actually. Yes. So it just kind of transitioned into what Here. we have now. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Mm-hmm. And also earlier, I heard you mention EMDR. Can you just explain to our audience um, that may not you know, have context to what that is, what EMDR is? Absolutely. So I'm going to try not to get tongue-tied. So EMDR st- stands for Eye Movement re- uh, Desensitization, Desensitization <laughs> and Reprocessing. So a very long name. But EMDR, um, it is a trauma-informed therapy. We say it is more somatic in nature, meaning usually when we think about therapy, we're talking about more talk therapy. So it's a more of a neck up therapy, a lot of narrative um uh, changing the way you think about things. And so this therapy is more focused on neck down. So it's really kind of tapping into the body. It's very body informed, trauma focused. Mm-hmm. So so when you're doing those eye movements, I'm really curious. So you know, you know like, about what it. Mm-hmm. No, I don't. You I said don't. eye but movements. Is, <laughs> that's what, right? <laughs> so, 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 so what is what is that to accomplish? Just curious. So, um, again, I'm going to try not to get too deep into it, but... Mm-hmm. If you think about when, um, well, first of all, I'll say the founder of EMDR, how she founded it was Mm -hmm. there was something going on with her. Um, She was walking along the beach and she noticed that as she was walking, her eyes were like moving back and forth. So that just kind of started her curiosity around that and research and all that stuff. So her name is Francine Francine Shapiro. Um, So... She started that, but one of the premises for the eye movement, or BLS we call it, or DAS, which is bilateral stimulation mm-hmm. or dual attention stimulation, is that it helps you to put um, keep like one foot in the past, one foot in the present. And how you can think about that is someone sleeping. Mm-hmm. If you've ever watched anybody sleep, not to be like crazy, <laughs> thing, but if you ever watched anybody sleep and you see their eyes like yeah, moving, kind of like a figure eight or just going back and forth, yeah. that's the same thing that we're trying to mimic in a way. When we sleep, our body is reprocessing. Mm-hmm. It is repairing, replacing, renewing um, our tissue, our muscles, different mm-hmm. things, resetting for us to be refreshed and start a new day, Right. So it's like a repair of trauma that has happened in the past. And the way that our body um, kind of makes these connections with different traumas is such that we can be in 2024 
something happens and it reminds us of something that happened Mm -hmm. two, three decades ago. And our body doesn't have a time stamp. So it's just like, oh, I remember that feeling. So now I'm right back into feeling that. So what we're trying to do with EMDR is keep a person in the present where they're safe, oh, wow. right? Mm-hmm. But one foot in the past so that they can access how those memories are reprocessed and um, are processed and basically unpack it and package it the right way so that they can have a different type of relationship with those memories. It happened. It sucked. I don't like it, but I'm not impacted by it where I can't regulate emotionally. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. She explained it way better than I could have because I tried to talk about it in a previous episode, but it was nothing <laughs> like that. I'll tell you that right she did now. a great job. And, <laughs> and, it, and it just lets you know that there are things out there that you can do, right? Like You Absolutely. don't just have to right. sit with you your trauma. You don't have to get stuck in it. Yeah, no. You don't have to be mm-hmm. stuck. No, yeah. not at all. Now, that does remind me... Um, um, of what people want to know. And Terrence usually takes this over. Terrence, I don't want to okay. steal your show, but... Don't worry about it. I got it. You got it? <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Okay, let me look up here. Let me what do right. the people want to know? The people want to know, as of January of 2024, <laughs> mm-hmm. know? there are over 3.3 million posts on Instagram mm-hmm. that says hashtag grief. So mm-hmm. the people want to know, should you post yourself crying on social media? Mm. And this is a question for me. Everybody. It, it, everybody. Oh, so the oh, people want to yeah. know. So you just, you, matter of fact, since you, you can go ahead and start. Okay. I don't mind. Um, I think people can do what people want to do. You right. So let's start there. Um, one part of us, uh, a strategy mm-hmm. in trying to work through um, kind of the the deep impacts of our grief experience is connecting with our people, finding our community. And we are a very social media yeah. heavy world now. Like this is how we access connection. It's very different from when I was growing up and uh, maybe some of you like, mm-hmm. but nowadays this is how we connect with people. So I think um, our grief needs to be witnessed um, there's a, a concept called mirroring, and we see that happen a lot with babies. Like, you smile at a baby, they smile back. You know, you laugh, they laugh back. Like, we want our experiences to be mirrored. Mm-hmm. And so, is it something that I would choose for myself? No. In fact, I've had a lot of losses, and you'll never <laughs> hear about it, read about it on social media, you know, none of that. Um, but if that is what someone chooses to do to get that connection, I don't have a personal issue with it. Mm-hmm. My concern is um, is that sometimes these types of platforms, people don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. So someone may be expecting something, their expectations are mm-hmm. here, and what they're getting back is not really what they expected or genuine. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, I like my circle small. So I would want my experience to be shared in a smaller circle, but if that works for someone and their need is being met, then do what you need to do. Hmm. My concern with it is often that um, when people, what I've seen is that when people are crying on social media, sometimes it's a call for help, and also Mm -hmm. sometimes it's it's their last resort, Um, Mm -hmm. and, and that's what scares me. I, I agree that I would never cry on social media, um, but I do acknowledge that if somebody is, you know, sharing their sad emotions on social media, on the web, um, maybe that is a, maybe that is a, a reason for me to reach out if I know this person um, personally. Maybe that's a reason for me to reach out to somebody they may know personally and be like, hey, you know, you might want to check in on this person. Mm-hmm. Um, so to me, I wouldn't do it personally, but I do understand why someone may do it. You know, it, it may be their last resort. It may even be their first resort. I don't know. But to me, I take it as a call to action. What can I do to help? And even if I can't help that person, you know, maybe I can share a resource with them. Maybe I can just send them a website and say, hey, I think you should check out these resources. Yeah. That's good. I like the way um, you explained it. People want connection. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that is whatever reason that might be, because it could have, you know, good intentions, could have bad intentions, but at the basis of it, they want connection. Um, You know, some people might say, oh, they just crying for it to get attention. Well, why do they want attention? For connection, right? Mm -hmm. So I think if we really try to understand what uh, people are trying to get, 
right? And try to help them fulfill that need so they don't have to go for attention seeking behaviors, yeah, as some right, people would say, right. then we can really help them, right? That call that action, mm-hmm. that call for help, uh, let them know you're not alone. I still mm-hmm. see you mm-hmm. and I hear you, then and validate them because I think that's what they go to social media for that validation. Because mm-hmm. um, you, whether that's for likes, shares, reposts, comments, it's, it's ultimately validation, in my opinion. I think you can um, really help that person through what they're struggling with mm-hmm. instead of just, you know, say, oh, this is a, they shouldn't be doing that, they mm-hmm. shouldn't be doing this, and why are they doing that? And they're just looking for attention. So I yeah. think trying to under, come, be, come from a place of understanding. Mm-hmm. That's good. And when we think about grieving holistically, um, social media is a, a huge factor in. Um, some people's grief, grief process. Social media is just such a huge platform um, that we can't we can't just avoid it and deny and make it seem like it's not a factor and it doesn't have an influence on how mm-hmm. some people may grieve. They may be positively influenced by social media and they may be negatively influenced. Um, but that just takes us to the QD of the hour, which is just a stat or quotable data that you can share with your loved ones and also share this episode with them as well. If you know someone that may be grieving or is having difficulty grieving um, or even if they're not grieving at all, we know that grief is a process that we all will have to experience one day or another. So go ahead and share with your friends. But information gathered from numerous HR professional organizations stated that six out of 10 companies have specific policies addressing bereavement. Among these organizations, the the average duration of time off provided for grief is 5.6 days. However, experts in grief counseling recommend a minimum of 20 days off for individuals who have recently experienced a loss. And the reference is PRNE Newswire. That's way up under that that recommended time off. Yeah. What y'all think about that? You you looking over there? What you think about this? How many days do you think we should a person should get? Oh, geez. I can start by saying it varies. Mm -hmm. It varies on who that person lost, um, what type of relationship they had. And there's so many different determining factors. So I understand why organizations may only permit, you know, uh, five or six days or whatever their policy is. I understand the, the standard policy, but then there's also a side to say, okay, this person just lost someone very close to them. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we may need to give them a little more grace or we may need to give them a little more time off so that they can take care of that self-care aspect and grieve properly. And then also I just want to highlight that even if they did take 20 days off from work, they're not going. Their their grieving process is not going to be no. complete in those twenty days. Absolutely not. That time off, you know, it's just time to um, regulate your emotions. You know, have some self care, spend time with family. Um, but I, I do believe that. Oof, grief is a is a long process. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, that is true. And like you said, it depends on who it is. I know some companies. If it's not your immediate family, like mom, sister. Grandma, grandpa, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. whatever you know it is. Mm-hmm. Oh, you, you ain't getting them days. Right. You better take that PTO or whatever you got. But mm-hmm. we ain't giving you those right. grieving or bereavement days. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it better be some auntie. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uncle. <laughs> PTO because the mm-hmm. bereavement doesn't count. And I mm-hmm. and I think that's that's not right because some people are closer to these extended family members that are not mm-hmm. immediate, um, and they still experience the same type of grieving process for that loss than they would was if it was a mom, dad, sister, brother, or grandparents. Mm-hmm. And I think um, personally that that bereavement period should include, you know, any type of loss. Um, yes, they had to put parameters in it because, mm-hmm. you know, it's business and corporations and stuff like that, but um, I don't like the limitations they put on it um, in some aspects. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Biology doesn't determine relationships. So mm-hmm. that's... One of the things for me is, and and nowadays when we think about the dynamics of a relationship, relationships are quite varied Mm -hmm. as well. So that automatically dismisses some um, types of relationships that we wouldn't consider like standard or normal or, you know, per whomever standards or whatever. So I think um, it's varied. I I certainly agree Mm -hmm. with you. I think in terms of the recommendation for the number of days, what came to mind, because I, I didn't know that statistic, but what came to mind is the thought around it taking about 
21 days to establish routine. Mm -hmm. If a person is in a space during that time where they can focus on establishing right. routine, that would certainly be helpful. That mm -hmm. that amount of time makes perfect sense to me. But mm -hmm. what I know to be true about grief and where people usually are immediately following um, a loss of any kind, mm -hmm. that's they're usually not there in 21 days following a loss. And you said a really great point about um, getting a person that just took a had a significant loss, they have to get back to that routine or right. not mm -hmm. even back to that routine. Um, they have to find a new routine. A new routine, And yes. what I listened to, um, I, I can't remember the resource, but I do remember it was on TikTok. A lady was describing that she just lost her dad, you know, a significant figure in her life. And her therapist said, you don't have to get back to your routine because your dad is no longer in your life. So mm -hmm. you can't get back to calling your dad every morning. You have to now adjust to a new routine. Right. and adjust to life with, without that person in your life. And it just reminded me about how grief is a process. Mm -hmm. um, and people go through stages, you know, of course, as you know, the. and I want you to explain a little bit, if you can, about the different stages of grief that a person may go through because it's, it's now a new routine, a new mm -hmm. um, adjustment that a person has to take, and it's, it's major. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I do know one of the first stages of grief is denial. Have you all ever experienced um, denial when it comes to losing a significant person in your life? Yep. All the time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't know to what extent I've experienced it, right? I feel as though yeah, sometimes in the beginning I, I may be like, man, come on, that can't be. Mm -hmm. But I've, I feel like I've seen people really stick with that, like, like, no, it ain't true. Like, really mm -hmm. stick with that. So I almost feel like there are levels to it. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it falls on a spectrum because it's more like denial and shock. Mm -hmm. I think your body is trying to regulate itself from like, that's a, that is actually, it's an immediate attack on the brain. Mm -hmm. Like immediate, like here's a threat to your brain. So your body is trying to figure out like what just happened. There's no longer this state of equilibrium. So I think some people, like it does take a little bit longer to kind of figure out the processing what just happened, the mm -hmm. processing the reality, and mm, the way the brain works again, there's a there's a threat there, and you immediately go into a different um, focus in terms mm -hmm. of survival. Right. So, kind of processing what happens, that kind of, it goes offline. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the internet messed up. It ain't it ain't working no more, and I think that that process can certainly take a little bit. A little mm -hmm. bit longer and even before then we have anticipatory grief mm -hmm. so a lot of this stuff that we're talking about is like once the event happens mm -hmm. but there's we experience some of these things and and others even before the loss mm -hmm. in fact we're living in a state of anticipatory grief right now because there are times that we think about oh you know one day mm -hmm. big mama not gonna be here mm -hmm. or you know what i mean or i'm going to be um, graduating or you know whatever those are things that we certainly like think about and we play mm -hmm. out I want to say when does it become grief though because I mean we might I might think about things like that but when does it become like this anticipatory grief um it becomes grief when you identify it as a loss in connection Mm -hmm. And there's no true measure mm -hmm. for that because it's more internal. Yes. So this is why we don't need to fall in the trap of comparing mm -hmm. because what we see is someone's expression of mourning. Mm -hmm. We see the crying, the going to the the funeral. We see those things. But, you know, we may say, oh, she looked like she's doing all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I may look like I'm doing all right, but I am tore down. Grieving. Right? A lot of time. You don't know what that experience is on the inside. So mm -hmm. that, that comparison, too, should go offline. Right. Right? So the, the moment that I identify that there's a potential loss or that, that mm -hmm. there's a loss in something or someone that I have a connection to, even if I don't love, like, care for that person, I, I grieve things that I dislike as mm -hmm. well. And Josh, I really appreciate how you spoke to the different um, severities of grief. Um, mm -hmm. Right now we're talking about the first phase or stage of grief, which is denial. And you did say that 
each person experiences that differently. Yours might be temporary. Okay, oh my goodness, I can't believe this person just passed. And then you move on to the next phase maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, it is different severities. And Samira, I also wanted to highlight how you said that our brain literally changes. Mm -hmm. Not only does our brain change, but the the um, chemicals inside of our brain changes. Our, our brain no longer is in this equilibrium homeostasis state of mind where it's calm, you know, normal. Now we have a lot of um, electrons and just mm -hmm. chemical imbalances. Mm -hmm. And then that just reflects in our actions, that reflects in our emotions. Um, so grief is very serious. And the first stage, of course, is denial, but that leads us to the next stage, which is anger. Mm -hmm. Do y'all want to speak on that a little bit? Yeah. And I just want to list all of the stages so that you all know what to anticipate. But the stages of grief is denial, Anger, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance. Well, I'm glad you named uh, all of them uh, because I don't think there's a specific order that it mm -hmm. goes into. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, because I know, like when my when my grandmother passed, like there were some people who was like, "Oh my God, I can't believe this has happened. This isn't real." And there were some people who was my uncle. He was mad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was. He was. He just went straight mm -hmm. to. Like, I already know, and he's just cussing and yelling at people. So he skipped, you know, well, one stage. But so I don't think it's a, you know, a step by step thing. I think it's, you know, fluid or whatnot. But I, I like the, I never really thought about anticipatory grief. Mm -hmm. is what yeah. Yeah. I never really thought about that because um, for, for, you know, sometimes I think about what if my mom wasn't here? Or mm -hmm. one day mm -hmm. um, my mom isn't going to be here. And I think about that, and that does make, you know, have a emotional response right. to that um but then at the same time i think about when my grandmother uh, was dealing with alzheimer's and everybody was having that anticipatory grief seeing her decline right 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 so and then trying to i think if you have that anticipatory grief it can help in a way because you're going through those stages and you're preparing yourself so when it does happen you are kind of accepted it at that point mm -hmm. uh, so i think that helps um but i also think it can prolong it in a way um sometimes um but i never really thought about that so i'm glad you really brought that up and um because i think we all do do that sometimes um, i even do it with my dog uh, mm -hmm. my, right mm -hmm. so like i've had my dog uh, zoe for 10 years mm -hmm. and one of my biggest fears is coming home from work and mm -hmm. she's passed away mm -hmm. and, right yeah. um i know that's in the another way is she, i have to take her to the vet because she's gotten sick my boss told me about that she's like yeah, that could happen i was like yeah but my fear Right. Anticipatory is I come home and yeah mm -hmm. um, she's passed away and then me going ahead and again having an emotional response right. to that's because how my brain is wired mm -hmm. um, I think that that is very good so I, I want people to really take that point of anticipatory grief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some I guess coping strategies for that anticipatory grief? Um, is it you, you know I mean how? What are healthy ways to think about it, right? Because I mean, you sometimes you can't help but to an anticipate, you yeah. know, what's the inevitable, right? Right. So, right. what are some healthy ways to think about? They go that voice again. I think. Um, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's what the voice? I mean, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Is it no, like wait, a, wait, wait, before, it's before a lingering you do it, wait, 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 wait. So, have you heard my voice change in any kind of? Way? I did. Then we got two. <laughs> <laughs> Accountability. I thought maybe you just needed to take a drink. <laughs> Dang, <laughs> it sounds bad. <laughs> it sounds bad. It I've never sounds seen, like. I've never seen, what it sound like. I'm not going to just notice. It sounds like um, what's the BET show at night? At night, what did you say? BET what's show at night. What's, what's the music? Girl? What's the what's that? Well, something so Dunny Dunny Simpson. Okay. I gotta, oh, look, oh, I gotta look that brother how up. How y'all doing out there tonight? <laughs> be a pretty it was wild. Brother. I mean, we just gonna take voice. it nice it's and slow. That part. <laughs> I might be gonna miss so, my call. So gonna, gonna, this is your call. <laughs> We're gonna ease into that question then. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. So. To say that there's a specific strategy, I would I, honestly, I would have to to think about that because I think the anticipatory grief is not as intense. I don't think is like again once the once the loss has happened, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm and I and I'm just saying that just off the cuff. I don't mm -hmm. think it is as intense as like that. 
that grief process. Mm -hmm. But what I do think is important in terms of strategizing is to not run away Mm -hmm. from the reality or the awareness that you have to lean into it. Mm -hmm. Um, There is, uh, do I have his book here? David Kiesler, who wrote... um, Finding Meaning, and he was actually like a mentee of Kubler-Ross, since we're talking about the five stages of grief here. Mm -hmm. Um, In this book, he he notes that he researched Buffalo. And, you know, he makes a joke about it, about researching Buffalo, and he's like, um, the reason for that is, he said, one of the practices with, um, practices, but yeah, one of the practices with Buffalo is when, whenever they realize that a storm is coming, they run into the storm. Mm-hmm. And they run into the storm the because crazy. they get to decide when it's going to hit. Mm. Mm-hmm. So instead of th- them waiting, mm-hmm. Instead of them them waiting and prolonging the process, they just run into the storm. And so they run into it, they get through it, they get on the other side, and it's done. You know, I think about times when there's a really bad storm because I was in a a wreck a few years ago. I'll pull Mm -hmm. over. And I ha- I honestly I have to sit there and think why am I doing that if I just keep if I just go through like I'm gonna get on the other side, Mm -hmm. right? Anticipatory grief and our experience just with. Grief in general is our tendency is to avoid, and we want to go this way. And so, what happens is now we have this built in companion of grief, mm-hmm. companion of this of grief. intense mm. grief, because we're not joining with it, we're not leaning into it, we are running away from it. So, we can't learn yeah. from it, right? So, and it's not right. going anywhere, mm-hmm. it ain't going no, it's place. not going right. anywhere. This is your experience, like, this is your stuff, and there is. Depression, there's anger, there's sadness, all of this stuff that we're talking about, but there's also mm-hmm. opportunity and beauty in it too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah. we don't get that if we don't act like the buffalo mm-hmm. and just yeah. run into it. I love that. I'm run done. into the storm. <laughs> that, that, and you talk about your car, your car situation. Uh, yeah. Um, I was in a motorcycle accident, I hit a deer. Mm. So in my mind, God. it's the same thing. Like if I if I'm riding my motorcycle and it's dark because I hit it at night. Mm-hmm. Um, if I get off on the exit where I got my got into my accident, I slow down. Mm-hmm. Which in my mind is like, oh, let me slow down and be cautious, which is smart. But at the same time, if I slow down, if there's another deer right. around the corner, right. mm-hmm. I have more like, more likely to hit that deer instead of just riding through it, right? right? Mm. Or um, you don't never want to ride a motorcycle and get caught in a storm, I'm mm-hmm. you, because those yeah. that rain feels like needles. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, if you if you see people pulled over on a motorcycle um, under a bridge, it's because they're trying to avoid the storm. Mm-hmm. But and there's been times where, right here, it's raining, it's pouring. Five minutes down the road, sun is shining, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just sitting here getting soaked because it's raining and pouring. I don't want to mm-hmm. move. I don't mm-hmm. want to move, mm-hmm. and I think that's one of the important things with grief. Uh, like you said, you have to move. You got to move. If you sit, you sitting in that grief, and that's and I'm not saying you shouldn't sit in a grief, but you can't stay in. I the don't. Grief. Yeah. Right. You gotta, so I right. think that's important. You gotta have. I do agree. I mean, you got to be able to see the other side. Yeah. Sounds like, or at and least have some hope that, yeah. it's, that it is. I, a, I would say have is. hope because yeah. sometimes when you're battling grief, you cannot see the other side mm-hmm. in, the, in that in that situation. But as long as you have that faith and that hope, faith and that hope. leads me to saying that not only is it important for us to press forward or, you know, an individual to press forward when they're experiencing grief, but it's so important to have a community around you that is able to support you during that time. It makes me think about um, one example of community is that my church, they provide like food and meals to a family that may have just recently experienced us um, a loss. And that is just one way that you can, you can show, you know, that person or that family, Mm -hmm. Hey, we see you. We, we know that you have needs we're here to help and support you um so that's just one example of of having a community to support you during that that low point in your life when you said that you need a support system that i brought up a question in and with that uh study of buffalo did it say the buffalo run together or it does like mm. if an individual buffalo is by itself and it see a storm mm. it's going to run by itself or is it like a because it's in a pack so i'm gonna ask you what do you think happens it, man they they wait Look, I, I, 
I'm just gonna say this. All right, me and Tamara, we have a. She she she's helped me with a lot of things in my career, and every time I would ask her a question, she do the same thing. So do I? yes, yes, yes. But but guess what though? It's Makes helped me a lot. Did somebody so, do that to you, Tamara? Just curious. All the time. See, it, but it helped me okay. a lot because so instead of she another. might know the answer, but instead of giving me the answer, I have to come up with my own answer, and it makes me think and process yeah. and, and come up with it. So I still, I awesome. always tell you, I appreciate that, and yeah. I will answer the question. I think it's when they're in a pack because we're going to tackle this storm together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what I think. Absolutely, at the core of who we are, we desire connection. Mm-hmm. We desire connection, safety, and security. Yep. Mm-hmm. So anybody who says like I like to be by myself then that may I mean I'm an introvert so I get I get that feeling but I also like my people mm-hmm. too your like, people my people your people yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Your like, yeah. yeah. so that I connection agree. um and this experience of grief is not intended to be pursued solo no mm-hmm. Right. Not at all. So we we need that. That is that is one of the strategies is mm-hmm. to find your people, mm-hmm. right? To find that support group, to find that group of and and the truth is now, the people might not be the people that you think should be there, yeah, yep. mm-hmm. or that you thought would be there. So your family, your friends, because honestly, our um, the, the same people would have. They don't know what to do. And this is often time, like why this conversation is so important because people don't know what to do. Right. And Listen and they don't know what to say. And it's almost like, um, I just want you to go ahead and get past this mm-hmm. so then I don't have to deal with mm-hmm. my stuff. There you yeah. go. Right. Because okay. if you're crying, I see you sad, then then now I feel mm-hmm. triggers. Yeah. So there we go. And so those may not be your people. Because yeah. those people are going to say, well, you just need to go ahead and get up and get yeah. over it. Come on, your people, yeah. Right? Those aren't, those aren't your people. Now, I'm not saying that, and we can talk about this later, that there isn't some truth in that. But there's a time for everything yeah. when it comes to the grief experience. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah, at some point, like I say, with healing through time, time does not heal all wounds. Mm-hmm. It does not. It's what you do in between the ticks because the clock is still going to tick. Mm-hmm. But what are you going to do? Right? You got you said it. You gotta move. Move. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is that it's okay to experience grief because it's a normal process of life. Absolutely. But you have to take action in that grief. We lose every day. We just lost five minutes ago. She minute said ago. that time is it, it ain't about the time, it's about what you do in between the ticks. Oh man. Did I preach? Yeah. <laughs> I felt. I felt. Well, we want to come back and preach some more. I'm, I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you. So, uh, Josh, <laughs> um, you have any more questions for again? I do want to ask Tamara. <laughs> 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 I was about to have one. He could, he could oh, get that little voice there. It went from a, Tamara, I do want to ask you. Um, have you seen like cultural differences in how people grieve, um, deal with grief? Oh, certainly. Um, I would just say my experience in in hospice was so enlightening, mm-hmm. honestly, because part of my experience there, I had to um, attend um, the funeral services or um, celebration of life mm-hmm. um, services for my clients that I served. And then we just had community members that we did that for. And there's certainly... A difference, I think, um, and I am generalizing here when I yeah. say that, that I think um, black and brown people are more expressive or more like outwardly emotive okay. um, than our counterparts. And for what reason, I, you know, mm-hmm. don't know. I think um, spiritually there are some differences okay. because I would certainly go to funerals um or or those celebrations where it was different like denominations Mm -hmm. um being celebrated and so there were some differences there as Mm -hmm. well um but again that does not change the core of what Mm -hmm. grief is right what we have to do on on this side of the table is just be aware that there are cultural um differences that we need to consider Mm -hmm. when we are engaging with people that we 
have conversation and dialogue about those things because sometimes it may just be the language. We're mm-hmm. talking about the same thing, but but it's the language that we need to get on the same page. Wow. About. That's mm. amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, sure. Tamara, where can we find you at? Your, your books? You, oh, your, everywhere. Not, not just your books, but where can we find <laughs> you at? So, um, with Healing Through Time, my information is there, but you can just Google Healing Through Time. Again, that is my grief resource brand. And so, you're going to find the bi monthly table talk podcast. Mm. Um, I have the grief journal and the card decks there, um, grief support group. I'll soon be working out, um, rolling out, I'm sorry, a community directory. So mm. um, for those of you listening out there that are experienced in this, whether you're a therapist, a coach, um, whatever, have a support group. If you're interested in being on that directory, you can reach out to me on Facebook, Healing Through Time, um, and on the website, healingthroughtime.org. That is going to be a free directory. So I'm saying that there's no charge to be on the directory. This is a um, this is my passion work. Mm-hmm. So a lot that I put into to that is just because I want to when I can. Mm-hmm. Um, outside of that, for therapy services, I have a group practice. It's virtual. There's myself, and I have three other clinicians that work with me. I have interns, supervisees, all the things, um, community partnerships. Um, I can be found at renewallifecounseling.com. Okay. That's the like name of that like practice. And other than that, like I'm out in these you mental health streets. She out anything? here, y'all. Social media, um, Facebook, Healing Through Time, uh, Renewal Life Counseling is on, and this is all Instagram. I'm not a big, like, you know, some of the other ones that are out there. Instagram, I have that too. Um, but then for you can my catch all is Houston Consulting. So everything I do is going to be on my Houston Consulting okay. page because I'm I'm promoting all of these things, but also any speaking engagements that I have or different opportunities that I'm bringing to the community. I like to put it on there so people will know what I got going on. So y'all heard what she said. She said speaking engagement. So that means if you like those these gems that she was out here mm-hmm. talking, gems, y'all yeah. need to go to Houston Consulting and get with Come her. On. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you. Come on. Well, Tamara, you're definitely doing remarkable work in our community. Mm-hmm. And like yeah. you said earlier, it starts one person at a time. Mm-hmm. So we definitely mm-hmm. want to give you your kudos and your credit while you're here on Speaking with Gravity. And we just appreciate your presence. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And all of the it's insight awesome. and knowledge you provided yes. today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You made it a, another great episode of Speaking with mm-hmm. Gravity. I can't say that. And we would love to have you back. Grieving holistically. Grieving holistically. We hope you all enjoyed this episode um, today. Please uh, continue to check in with the show. And please check in with our guest, uh, Ms. Tamira Houston. She's been great. And I know you all um, have learned some things from this episode and taken some things with you. And we hope that you will continue to engage with her. So till we meet again, we'll we'll see you all soon on the next episode of Speaking With Gravity. Take care, y'all. See you.